Hi everybody, this is uh, Todd Burke, and I'm sure you're aware. I'm going to try and do this quickly today. I'm really hungry, and there's nobody around for me to be mean to. So I'm going to see if that motivates me to go quickly. This is probably going to be a half an hour lecture. Afterwards, there's one math problem for you. That's about it. Um, let me see now if I can turn on my presentation and have it actually view me simultaneously. I may edit out some of this later. Ooh, exciting. No way. Okay. Ooh, fancy. Hi, everybody. So, this is my first lecture and a series I'm going to do for the rest of the school year, we're going to talk about the theory of relativity. This first lecture is on the equation E equals MC squared, which many of you know. A famous equation of Einstein's. Um, some of the stuff you know about it may be wrong. And i um, hoping you learn a lot more today. <clears throat> I'm going to try and do this quickly. I'm super hungry and there's nobody around for me to be mean to. So I'm going to try and use that to motivate me. I hope I don't speak too fast. Luckily, you can always pause and rewind. So here's the story. There's our topic. <clears throat> this is just a big experiment. Hopefully, I can edit this, make a decent uh, uh, video out of it. Most people know that this was Einstein's most famous equation. It's one of the most famous equations in all of science. <clears throat> a lot of people actually know what the variables stand for. So you're... Great. You're doing really well. If you know that E stands for energy, M stands for mass, and C stands for the speed of light. So we'll talk about C as a shorthand way of referring to the speed of light a lot in this theory of relativity. Now, again, this is not about relativity. In fact, you don't need to know Einstein's theory of or equation here in order to understand relativity. Um, so, C stands for the speed of light, which is important as a number. And we'll be doing a little math at the end of this video and in subsequent videos on the theory of special relativity. So there you go. The uh, um, speed actually is 299,792,458 meters per second. That's the velocity at which light travels. We're going to round it off like we always do. It's really close to a big round number there. We're going to say 300 million meters per second. So that's what C stands for when it comes time for math. <clears throat> or we could say three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, which is the same as about three E eight meters per second squared. Now, if you're gonna do your math online, that's just a nice simple way to shorten everything and make sure the calculator can, online calculators can handle it. Type in three E eight as your number for the speed of light. Okay, so um, there's also a lot of misinformation and, and misunderstood, uh, um, incorrect information, I guess. People are wrong about some things, and it's probably a bummer for this guy. This actually is exemplifies some of the fallacious uh, kind of, um, what am I trying to say? <clears throat> Unfortunately for Einstein, this, um, okay, start this again. <clears throat> there is some, a common misperception that Einstein is the father of the atomic bomb. And this Time magazine cover shows his famous equation in the, in the mushroom cloud there over an uh, explosion of atomic bomb and his face, obviously. And the truth is um, he, you don't need that equation in order to create the atomic bomb. And he wanted nothing to do with that. <clears throat> he in 1939 did write a letter to uh, FDR, President Roosevelt. And in the beginning of World War, or just before we entered World War II saying the Nazis are gonna take over the world and they're going to, nothing, no one's going to be able to stop them if we don't. They're building this bomb. My scientist friends in Germany tell me they're getting close to solving the problem so they can create a fission bomb. 
and then there'll be no stopping them. And we need to beat them in that race. And so he encouraged the United States to build the bomb. When they invited him in 1942 to join the Manhattan Project and build it, he wanted nothing to do with it. He said, that's not how I want to put my brains to work and share my gifts and killing millions of people with uh, military weapons. So he refused to be part of it. And then later in his life, he um, regretted this. This is his biggest moral regret in life that he actually encouraged this because he just feels that uh, or felt that the um, science outpaced our morality and we shouldn't have uh, weapons that can cause so much destruction. So it made him sad that the, that the bomb was built, but actually it wasn't based on his work. So what E equals MC squared does is give us an ability to calculate how much energy came out of the explosion. Of course, <laughs> we can use that formula to find out how much energy can, comes out of any reaction, um, including um, maybe burning a candle or lighting a campfire. However, you don't need to understand physics or that formula in order to make a fire or to have discovered fire, right? So the building of the bomb didn't need his work, um, although FDR already did his encouragement. And in that case, he is in fact um, involved in creating our nuclear age. Okay, so this was a sadness for him. Um, but what does E equals MC squared mean? Well, <clears throat> it allows us to calculate how much energy there is. It tells us that energy is equal to, it's an equivalence, it equal to math, mass times the speed of light squared. And because it's an equivalence and because the speed of light is a constant, it never changes, neither does the speed of light squared. If you have more energy, if energy goes up a little bit, then so does the mass. If you can use a bunch of energy and reduce the amount of energy, then you have to reduce the amount of mass as well. They're equivalent. If you do a calculation, there's a whole lot of energy in this reaction, then there must be a whole lot of mass. They are proportional. <clears throat> so that's how we'd write that they're proportional. And um, we might, in fact, explain uh, to someone who reads this like a language, say that, oh, energy is equal, is the same as mass. In fact, we now believe they're the two sides of the same coin. Just like we will talk about in special relativity, space and time are actually a connected entity. They are the same thing. And um, in this case, mass and energy are as well. If you speed up anything fast enough, it turns into pure energy. <clears throat> we'll talk more about it. So we can use this to calculate exactly how much energy would be released if we convert some mass into energy. <clears throat> now, that this is uh, involved in any type of reaction that uses energy or conserves energy or stores energy. Um, so the reality though is most of our energy conversions are so inefficient, we wouldn't see much mass change at all. It'd be a very, very, very small amount of energy derived from mass loss or mass gain. Very, very, very small amount of mass involved. And um, in that case, you'd be dividing the amount of energy released by the speed of light squared, a huge number, which means we're talking about a very small amount of energy. And most energy reactions are incredibly inefficient. There's one type of energy transformation that exists in the universe. And it's pretty common in other places in the universe. And not only do we not see it on Earth, but our engineers can't find a way to harness it. They may never. But that one type of energy transformation is 100% efficient. So all of the mass gets converted into energy. And if that were the case, it would take only a very tiny, small thing to create a huge amount of power. Here's my flux capacitor. Imagine we had some fancy device like the flux capacitor that could take all the energy out of a raisin, could take a little raisin, extract all the energy out of it. Well, that one raisin would be enough to power all the electrical needs for the entire city of New York, 10 million people for one day, or twice the number of people who live in LA, a city twice the size of Los Angeles for an entire day, just from one raisin. 
we'll talk about this energy transformation at the end of this lecture. So, <clears throat> we'll begin by talking about nuclear reactions because they're really huge, talk, lots of energy, so it's easier to actually have some numbers that uh, we can deal with, and they're pretty efficient. Um, <clears throat> so, they're in fact 10 million times more efficient than chemical reactions like setting fire or something. A fire gives off all this energy. It seems like a lot to us, but it's not super efficient. If we're actually to take all that mass and can, instead of having a chemical reaction with it, just convert it straight into energy, it would be billion time, billion times more uh, efficient, 10 million times more efficient. Um, okay, I'm saying that all wrong. <clears throat> If we could take all of the mass in, let's say, the wood of a campfire and just convert it directly into energy, it would be 10 million times more efficient than that fire. So to begin, let's talk with the example of a power plant. An average city's power plant, one of the national power plants in the United States, would be 100,000, so it'd be 1,000 right, 1,000 million watts of power for a 1,000 megawatt power plant. Now, in the picture here, we have a coal-fired power plant. So imagine that we have this thing. It actually burns um, about 15 trains worth of coal every day. That would be 100 cars per train, about 15 of them per day in order to produce all the energy it needs. <clears throat> Now, let's say we're actually weigh all that stuff going in, all that coal and all the oxygen it takes out of the air when the coal burns. Okay. And then we're to weigh all the products, all the stuff that comes out of this reaction. So all of the soot and pollution, all the mercury and lead and stuff that gets put in the air that came out of the, the um, coal originally, all the steam in that smoke, all the CO2, carbon dioxide that goes in the air, everything that's produced, if we're to weigh them all, what we find is, wait a minute, they don't add up. Now, Antoine Lavoisier in the 1700s did some really precise chemical reactions and uh, measured very accurately everything that went in, everything went out, and came up with what became known as the law of the conservation of mass or the law of conservation of energy. And these numbers should be the same. Everything that gets put into a reaction, all the reactants, should equal all the products and things that come out. And if we are dealing with big numbers like this, big scale, hundreds of trucks, carloads full of um, coal, right? Huge amounts of energy out of these thousand megawatt power plants. And we're to measure it, let's say for an entire year, all the inputs and all the outputs, they won't add up. In fact, there'll be a little bit of something missing. The mass will be lost. There'll be a little bit of mass that has disappeared. And that is because of the energy that's created. Some of that, what was mass has been released it was potential energy and as we create the, the energy that mass has gone down because we know that energy and mass are equivalent and now that that coal has less energy in it its mass went down so the products after this reaction are actually smaller let's take another example here's a, another mega 1000 megawatt power plant this would be a nuclear power plant so we have uranium which is now creating the heat which turns the turbines and makes electricity same amount of electricity in a year, exact same amount. We weigh all the uranium goes in. Now, this is a lot smaller. We don't use very much, like one carload full of uranium. And we actually would probably change it out every five years. So not too much going in. And then there's no air pollution that comes out of it. But um, we do have some spent uranium cooling rods. We have some byproducts of plutonium and americium and some things that are uh, left over. And then we have this waste that we have to get rid of that will be reactive for many, many years. And if we were to measure the uranium that came in at the beginning of that year and then measure it, what's left at the end of that year, and then figure out how much energy we have, what we should find is the mass in doesn't equal the mass out. There's some mass that has disappeared. There's a mass lost. Okay, well, we have these two power plants. The mass lost, meaning can't be account accounted for. The numbers don't add up. There is some missing mass. If we multiply that times the speed of light squared, that crazy number we get will exactly equal the amount of energy 
that 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 each 1000 megawatt power plant created in the year we can calculate how much energy is there in fact because they're both making the same amount of energy they're both 1000 megawatt power plants and they both are working for one year that amount of mass should be equal exactly the same so now there are some differences of course um the coal fired power plant had a whole lot more coal coming in just a huge amount of mass and it was an inefficient chemical reaction and if you were to measure the amount of mass that disappeared that at the end of the day didn't quite add up there's some gone when we measured the smoke and the soot etc <clears throat> that amount of mass loss would be exactly the same as the amount of mass loss for the nuclear power plant which would have less pollution which would have which would involve smaller uh, amounts of mass to begin with <clears throat> And of course, if you're talking about differences, the clean power of the power plant, of course, then has this problem with we've got to, we need now the input of this radioactive stuff, which has to be transported across the country. And, you know, you have a truckload of that stuff wreck, you have lots of problems. If we use a nuclear power plant, then we end up with the waste products, which we have to dispose of and will remain dangerously radioactive for thousands of years. So we got problems in both cases there are trade-offs <clears throat> the exciting the interesting the i think revelatory new information is some mass completely disappears from this universe it seems to break that law of the conservation of mass and it that little bit of mass that's completely lost if you multiply it by the speed of light squared it exactly equals the huge amount of electricity created by both power plants over the course of one year but this same phenomenon works with a candle. If you have a candle that wax vaporizes and becomes a fuel and sustains the flame, and you can measure how much the mass goes down, and you can measure how much energy came out. Not that much energy. And you want to, they should be something we could use the same equation, e equals mc squared, and figure out what's going on. Now we'd have to measure all the stuff that comes out of that chemical reaction. All of the Oxygen that goes into it as well as the wax. So we'd have to measure the amount of oxygen taken out of the air. Not easy. Then we'd have to measure the carbon dioxide and the steam and the soot and the ash left behind for all the products. And they won't quite equal up. There'll be a slight little bit lost in the product. And that change in mass will equal the amount of energy that came out. So e equals mc squared works even if there is no burning. It has to do with all types of energy transformations, which is crazy. This is the part I think that is blew my mind when I first learned it. So um, let's say we have a ball and we take this ball and pick it up. It now has more potential energy. It has greater energy. And so it weighs more. <laughs> um, <clears throat> if I put it back down on the floor, it has less potential energy <laughs> and the weight goes back down. Now, this is a tiny, tiny, small difference in weight, right? We talk about the amount of potential energy here and then divide it by the speed of light, which is already a huge number. And then we square that number. And so we divide it by this massive, massive number. I can show both hands there. And therefore, we're ending up with a very small quantity but there is an increase in mass. Nothing we could measure on a scale unless we have something bigger like the sun, something larger to talk about. But in this case, I add a little bit of potential energy, it weighs more. In fact, its weight, its potential energy comes from the gravitational fields between it and the earth. So the earth ball gravitational system itself weighs more. And when I put it back down on the floor, it weighs less. To me, that's pretty weird. I can do other examples. Like I have some, a little rubber band right here. And if I pull this thing apart and I put more potential energy into it, oh, look at how strong I am. Now it weighs more, <laughs> it has more energy. It has more mass. There aren't more, a greater number of atoms, but bound in the electrostatic fields between those atoms, there is more, each atom has more weight there's more energy and it weighs more as a result. Same thing with this battery. 
I charge it up. It weighs more. I use the battery, so now it has less energy inside of it. It weighs less. That is what the law stands for. Now you understand what equals mc squared means. Beforehand, you maybe knew that c was a speed of light. m stood for mass. Now you understand what this equivalency actually tells us about the universe and how it works. Okay, so... <clears throat> nuclear reaction, nuclear fission, like we have in a nuclear power plant, only converts about 1% of its mass into energy. So out of those, you know, thousands of coal trains, coal cars that would be delivered in a um, year to that power plant, right? Only 1% of that mass would just get annihilated and cease to exist in our universe and be converted into energy. <clears throat> um Chemical reactions are even less efficient by 10 million times. The physical properties, uh, for example, the potential energy in this tennis ball, it's, and the increase in that when I raise it a little bit, are minuscule in comparison to chemical reactions. But there is one type of reaction that is 100% efficient. Now, we haven't studied astronomy, but in my diagram there did not work out so that you can see it. But basically, there is such a thing as antimatter. It doesn't exist only in science fiction movies. This is real. And we actually can create it and we can actually contain it. It's a crazy thing. If antimatter, it is a phenomenon that is similar mass um, as regular matter with an opposite charge. And when it um, touches real matter, antimatter and real matter annihilate each other. They just explode and cease to exist in this universe. They like pop into another dimension. We don't really know what happens. And in that process, a gamma ray is created. Well, in the process of a single electron uh, hitting a positron, right? Uh, a, a single gamma ray is created. In the sun, for example, inside any star, I've got to turn my phone off, it's making noises. Inside the uh, fusion, nuclear fusion reactions of a star, that is a small kind of side note to the fusion process, but that is the only place where light is created. It is because of that annihilation where a <clears throat> bit of matter and antimatter meet and cease to exist. That cancellation event is the what creates a gamma ray, which is the birth of all light from stars, from our sun. Now we do get light from campfires, chemical reactions, there's bioluminescence bio and other things, fluorescence of minerals and atoms can get excited. But from nuclear fusion and stars, that kind of light is created only from matter-antimatter collisions. And those cancellation events are really common in stars, in the cores of stars. So there's an example. I bring it up because that is the one type of reaction that is 100% efficient. So all of the mass disappears and is converted completely into energy. Now, if we could harness that, remember our flux capacitor from the beginning of this lecture, if we could just take one raisin and get 100% of the energy out of it, we could feed all the energy needs for the entire city of New York, over 10 million people for a day. So if we had a box of raisins, I mean, there are there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of raisins in there. So we could probably go 10 years. Um, I don't know why that just happened. Um, so we, in order for it to work, we'd have to have a box of raisins. There we go. <clears throat> we need to have a box of raisins, but we would also need a box, which I don't have, of anti-raisins. All right, here's my example. I have uh, root beer, and w root beer, and I have... Yeah. Anti root beer. Here's diet root beer. And so we would put them both into our crazy antimatter power plant. And that device would release 100% of this mass as energy. Now, if you multiply this amount of mass times the speed of light squared, you get enough energy that we could power all of New York City, create, pro provide for all the energy needs for all over 10 million of the city's residents for something like a decade. 
that's an efficient energy transformation. Okay. <clears throat> Moving on here. This is just some silliness, but I thought you'd find it interesting. If we had um, light, um, you could think of it maybe as energy that has been sped up really fast. So here I have a laser, and if I point to shine that, hopefully you can see that laser here. My question to you is, then what would happen if you could take that laser right here, and I were to slow it down, what would I, what would that look like if light is matter that has been sped up really fast? Take any matter, take my antimatter root beer and accelerate it to the speed of light, it will turn into pure energy, pure light. Speed up the speed of light, it becomes light. So if you took light and slowed it down, what would that become? All right. Silliness, just something for you to think about. Let's do some math. So how do we calculate energy here? We have our formula. I hope you can see that on your screen. It looked good when I did this before, and now it looks like it's slightly off the screen. Luckily, you know it. E equals mc squared. Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. Now we know them. Let's say I'm going to give you a math problem, and we're going to make it easy. I'm just going to say we have one kilogram. So mass equals one kg, one kilogram. Speed of light we know is um, three. I'm sorry that I don't quite have that written the way I like it, but uh, times ten to the eighth meters per second. So that one hundred eight should be the eight should be a superscript. It should be ten to the eighth, or we could say three e eight meters per second. Now the formula says c squared, speed of light squared. So we'd say c squared equals three e eight meters per second times three e eight meters per second, or the result is you multiply those two integers, uh, three times a three is nine. And then for the exponents, when you multiply them, you end up adding the numbers. So nine E 16 is what the speed of light squared is. And you have to square the units as well. So that's meter squared per second squared. So now we, ha we have two variables out of the three. It's the same kind of math where I've multiple times told you that this is super easy. It's only either multiplication or division. Super easy, but the f variables seem weird and the numbers might seem big and the units are strange and it might be intimidating, but we just have three variables. If I give you any two of them, you should be able to find the, the remaining, the third variable. So here we're going to do some multiplication and division. The only thing that's weird is we got some big numbers. Okay, so we're going to solve for E. I gave you the mass, one kilogram. We know the speed of light squared is always 9E16 meters squared per second squared. Here's what that math would look like. We'd have one kilogram times nine E16 meters squared per second squared. And we get nine E16 joules. So if we took that one kilogram mass and converted all of it into energy, we'd have nine times 10 to the 16th joules of energy, which is a lot. <clears throat> okay, so we can also do the same thing and we can reverse the equation. We could say that the unknown is mass. We know how much energy we have. How do we calculate the mass? Well, in this case, we don't just have to multiply. We have to rearrange that equation to find the mass there. Um, now, let's use the same problem as last time. Our unknown will be mass. We know the energy is 9 E16 joules, and the speed of light is still 9 E16 meters squared per second squared. So now to solve for mass, you have to divide. With your rearrange equation, you see now there in green, I have E divided by C squared equals mass, or the amount of energy divided by the speed of light squared will tell us what we're looking for. So we have E, no, 9 E16 joules divided by 9 E16 meters squared per second squared. And that gives us one kilogram. Now I've shown you here in white that a joule is equal to a kilogram 
meter per second squared. So when I divide meters per second squared by meters per second squared, they cancel out. And the only unit left behind is a kilogram. So 9E16 divided by 9E16 cancels out to 1. And the only units left are kilograms. So when we work this problem, same problem we did before. It's just another example. But work it backwards, we get the same answer we had before. The mass is 1 kilogram. So the creation of 9E16 joules of energy annihilates and wipes out from our universe the existence of 1 kilogram of mass. But the law of conservation still applies because now it's a law of the conservation of mass energy. And while we have one kilogram of mass gone, we have the equivalent amount of energy been introduced into our universe. And so then because of that equivalency law, the laws of physics still work. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about our sun. Now, here's another example where this occurs and in a big scale so we can have some numbers to deal with here. Um, every second it releases, releases 3.8 times 10 to the 26 joules of energy. Now that's something that we can, we can measure how much comes right at the earth and then figure out, well then how much would, if the sun is a sphere, how much goes off in all the other directions as well. That's some pretty basic stuff. And we feel pretty comfortable saying that it's, the answer is the sun generates about 3.8 times 10 to the 26 joules of energy every second. Now, that'd be enough to <laughs> light up a whole lot of light bulbs, but I want you to do some math with it. Now, I just gave you an example. If I give you the amount of energy and you know the speed of light squared, you should be able to calculate what is the mass. So, we've got this problem here. E equals the amount of energy coming out every second equals 3.8. E26, or 3.8 times 10 to the 26 joules of energy. Speed of light squared still is E, sorry, 3 E8. I did that wrong too. That's just a regular speed of light. The speed of light is still 3 E8 meters per second. Now what you need to remember is the speed of light squared would be 9 E16 meters squared per second squared. But you can rewind and, and look at that previous example. Your job is to calculate what is the mass loss every second. Our sun gets smaller. It has less mass and it gets smaller by an exact amount we can calculate with just a division problem. If we know how much energy is coming out of the sun, how much mass is lost or annihilated from our universe every second? Solve for M, solve for mass. Okay, you want to submit your answer on Google Classroom. Show me all your work. Show me your units. There's only one math problem. You had to suffer through my video. About a half an hour, and you have to do one math problem. That's it for today. I'll give you two more videos this week. We'll do three more next week. Then I'll complete our unit on relativity. I will give you one final video. It's just a bonus for those of you geeks who are enjoying this stuff. It will give you an explanation so you can understand the book, A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. It came out when I was just about after I graduated from high school and there's a big buzz about it. And like a lot of people went out and bought it. I've heard this book described as the one of history's most popular books, which no one has ever read. <laughs> it's um. Hard to understand. So I read it a couple of times and didn't understand the thing of it. I think I can do a pretty good job now of understanding it. So I'm going to explain some of the uh, the Michelson Morley experiment and a lot of the background science that's explained in the early chapters as an extra bonus seventh lecture. Don't listen to it if you don't want to. Um, but if you want to go read that book, you'll do really well after hearing these six lectures and you'll do even better after hearing that seventh one. So that's what you can expect. Um, and then at that point, seniors will leave us and I will have one final assignment. Basically, I'm gonna have a really great movie for you to watch. And I'm gonna have you use what you've learned on these six videos with these six brief math assignments or writing assignments. I'm gonna have you show off your stuff by analyzing that video. I'm gonna give you one question. I'm gonna have you write, you know, like 
one page, maybe 100, 240 words in response to that question about the movie. Seniors will be gone. The, the only assignment they're missing is that. They'll have gotten all the information on relativity. I encourage them to watch the movie. Wash your hands. Stay safe. Be mean to your brothers and sisters. It'll help you feel better about yourselves. I'll uh, send you another video soon. Bye.